everyone! Before we begin today, we want to thank our newest patron, Kara. Welcome to the team. If you too want access to our notes, outtakes, bonus episodes, live streams, and more, as well as our undying gratitude, consider joining our team at patreon.com slash pod and prejudice. If becoming a patron isn't in the cards for you right now, another way you can support the show is by using our code pod and prejudice 20 when you buy Snacklins. Snacklins are a vegan grain-free version of pork rinds that literally taste like heaven on earth. Truly, most of my conversations with Becca and Graham the past few weeks have just been us talking about how much we love Snacklins. So go to snacklins.com and use our code pod and prejudice 20 for 20% off your first order. And now enjoy this week's episode covering chapters 13 to 15 of Sense and Sensibility. Now that we are all set up, how are you doing? I just ate a lot of miracle noodles. What are miracle noodles? Oh, you should know about them. They're like made of mushroom, I want to say. Like they're made of something that's like really low calorie. Okay. And they are not great for replacing pasta, but they're great for replacing like a rice noodle. Oh, yeah. Like, we we eat sweet potato glass noodles. Those taste better than Miracle Noodles. Okay. Cool, cool. Miracle Noodles are great, though. Uh, they're great for, like, a stir fry. But sometimes, and I don't always know why, they give me a stomach ache. And they're giving me a bit of a stomach ache right now. Mm. But I did a good job with them. I covered them in Malaysian curry powder with some seitan, Ooh. some just egg, Ooh. some oyster mushrooms, Ooh. and some garlic. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and some spinach. Yum. Also... As a follow-up to what we talked about a few episodes ago, or maybe it was last episode, but I think it was two episodes ago, and maybe I cut it, I can't remember, but I froze the tofu, and now it's thawing, and then I have to freeze it again, right? And then <laughs> eventually I'm going to end up cooking. I did that too. I did that too. Although I made breaded chicken with it, and I wasn't a fan. I mean, it was good. The breading was amazing, but I needed to like season the innards of the tofu, and the way I breaded it, it kind of like solidified a bit again. Oh, I see, I see. I'm thinking what I'm going to do is make kind of like a like a plant milk and flour dredge type thing and then bake it. Do you think that'll work? Here's what I did and I'll recommend it because the batter and stuff was good. I just think I needed to like brine the tofu. So I mixed Dijon mustard with water. <gasps> Sorry, mustard is my favorite. Continue. So Dijon mustard and water made up the batter. Mm hmm. And then I used flour in a bunch of spices. I'm sure you can use like chickpea flour or whatever flour doesn't hurt your tummy. Yeah. Um, and mix it with like paprika, ground mustard, onion powder, garlic powder, uh, salt, pepper, cayenne. Mix that together, like dip it in the mustard, then dip it in the flour mixture. And you could either bake it. I fried it and it was delicious. The batter was really good. The, the tofu needed work. So like maybe what I could do is marinate it in the batter for a while and it would get like nice and moist or I would put it in like if I were to pick what I would put it in I'd put it in something pickle briny I don't have any pickles well something of that ilk listeners by the time this gets to your ear holes I will have already done this but uh if you have suggestions let me know retroactively (laughs) and I do know that I got this off of the New York Times website okay okay I also follow someone on Instagram who posted a recipe for this very thing before you told me about it so maybe I'll go back to his page and see what he suggested I think it was pretty simple though I think he just like breaded and baked it all right we'll see we'll see listeners Anyway, should we should we talk about Jane Austen? Yes, we should talk about Jane Austen. There's a lot to talk about this episode. Becca, I am literally falling apart at the seams. <laughs> I don't even so it's been a few days since I one read the chapters, two looked over my notes, but I remember being like I stayed up. I was so I was like going to bed and I was like going to read them the next day. And then I was like, "You know what? Eh, I'll read them now." And this is why I didn't text you about this set of chapters <laughs> because it was like midnight or later and I was like Becca's asleep but what the f- how dare Jane Austen first of all <laughs> priceless priceless we'll get into it but like this set of chapters literally had me awake for an hour reading past my bedtime <laughs> and I'm sure furious that I made you stop reading absolutely I was what's the word gutted I'm watching the Great British Baking Show so I was gutted <laughs> But well, we'll get into it in a minute. We should probably Becca Molly, but oh my god! This is Becca. This is Molly. We're here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically talking about Sense and Sensibility, and even more specifically, chapters 
13 to 15 of Sense and Sensibility. Listeners, if you are new here, I would first recommend listening to the first couple chapters of this book. But in case that's not your vibe, I, Molly, have never read any Jane Austen aside from Pride and Prejudice. I, Becca, have read many a Jane Austen, including Pride and Prejudice. And if you want to hear Molly read Pride and Prejudice for the first time, check out season one of Pod and Prejudice, but that's not what we're doing today. No, it's not. Today we're talking about Sense and Sensibility. I tweeted a few days ago, Sense and Sensibility, I was not ready. And one of our listeners was like, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to spoil it, but I can't wait to hear what you were not ready for. And (laughs) honestly, so much. (laughs) I was not prepared to be literally up in my bed, like, Page Turner. Like, oh my God, what's gonna happen next? What do you mean they didn't go to the boat? They didn't <laughs> they didn't go to the boat. Because our entire last episode, you were like, what do you think's gonna happen when they go to this place with the boat? And I was like, it's gonna rain. You were like, oh yeah, they're gonna have a bad time. It's gonna rain. They're gonna get caught in the rain. And I was sitting there being like, oh, they wish. They wish they got caught in they the rain. They wish they got caught in the rain. Oh my god. All right, should we get into it? Yes. So you can see why this book is a little bit more drama. Yeah, it's high stakes. I think I'm I think I like this better than Pride and Prejudice. Oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I can't really make a decision yet, but that's what I think. Here's what I'm gonna say. I love all of Jane Austen's works. Of the ones I've read, I have a clear least favorite, but I still love it. And there's a lot for it. But Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice are sort of apples and oranges. They're very different books despite what many might think, because they're all about highfalutin women in Regency era England True. and <laughs> romance. Yeah. But I love this book and I'm so hyped you're into it. So let's get into it. Yes. So at the end of last chapter, they had all been planning on going to Colonel Brandon's cousin's place. So they were all planning this day trip and they were going to go boating and it was going to be a blast and it was maybe going to rain. But the trip did not go as planned as we find out early on in this chapter, because drum roll, please. They don't go at all. They're having breakfast and they're all hanging out, getting ready to leave. And Colonel Brandon gets a letter and he goes pale and leaves the room. First of all, the drama. Oh, yes. Just starting off off the bat. Wait, Graham, we we need like a da da da. He goes pale and leaves the room. Or like a lightning flash or something. Not a lightning flash because this is a podcast, but a thunderclap. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we meant. <laughs> Lady Middleton speculates that only something very serious could make Colonel Brandon leave her breakfast table because he is a very polite man and her breakfasts are very good. When he comes back, Mrs. Jennings asks if his sister is worse. Question, sister? Sick sister? He says no, he's been called into town on business. And Mrs. Jennings is like, what business could possibly call you into town right now? And Lady Middleton is like, leave him alone. And then Mrs. Jennings asks if his cousin Fanny is writing to tell him that she's getting married. And another question. Different Fanny. I'm sure it's a different Fanny, but Jane Austen, you have the ability to name these people different things. Why aren't you doing it? I'm telling you, it's a common lady name in this time. I know. But the thing is that this is a fictional novel. So she could name these people different things. Like she could have. She just chose not to. Okay, this is going to become something we're going to discuss a lot because, no, she won't do that. Yeah, okay. Speaking of which, I was doing our texts for the group chat on Patreon. Listeners, if you're interested in that, on Patreon, we do screenshots of our group text. And one of the questions I asked Becca was, and I don't remember what the tweet was that I saw, but it was something about John Willoughby. And I said to Becca in all caps, Fucking no. Is Willoughby's first name John? Listeners don't tell me. Becca is keeping a stone face. She didn't respond to my text. But if his name is fucking John, I swear to God. Okay, we've gotten through four bullet points. So he says no. Then Mrs. Jennings is like, okay, then. And she gets all smirky. She's like, I know who it is from and I hope she is well. The drama. Yeah, Mrs. Jennings has no problems in her life at this point. So she likes to observe the problems in everybody else's lives. So she's just having a great time being like, oh, I know this secret. This is a secret I know about. And she does it loudly and in front of everyone. She's like, I know who it is from and I hope she is well. And he blushes and immediately changed the subject, saying he has to leave immediately and he won't be able to take them to Quitwell, which is where they were going. 
And so everyone's upset. It's kind of sad, though, because they're all really upset that he can't take them. And it's kind of like, kind of like it is that they only wanted him to come because he was the one who was going to take them there and let them in. Basically, he could open the door for them. They don't actually care about hanging out with him. It's very sad. They're begging him to stay. And he's like, no, 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 I can't. And then Willoughby says to Marianne that he bets Brandon is making it up. Because he's adverse to fun and is afraid of going and catching a cold on the water. And I just really don't like that. I don't like that vibe from Willoughby. I don't like how mean he is. And I don't like that he's getting Marianne to be mean with him. Yeah. And that's such a common trope. We all have like people we know who are meaner around other people. Yeah. There's people I'm mean around too. Oh, oh, me too. I mean, Becca and I are both very nice people listeners. You know this, but. Yes. Yes. I think we're speaking to something universal. Like. You can be nice and also have some people who you talk shit with. Exactly. Yes, it's healthy. It is, except I don't like Willoughby, so I'm not, I'm going to go ahead and keep <laughs> calling him out on it. Yes, in this circumstance, it's bad because if you're going to be mean about people, they have to deserve your mean. That is something I feel very strongly about. And Colonel Brandon has done nothing. You cannot be mean to people who don't deserve your meanness. If you're going to be mean, it has to be to someone who deserves it. Yeah. They mention that there are two Miss Carries there also. They're like, come on, the Miss Carries are here. And I just wanted to say about them that I don't think that they're going to be important. Do you want me to tell you? No. Okay. I don't know. Unless they're not important. If if I'm right, you can tell me. If I'm wrong, Okay, yeah. You're you're looking at a Mariah Lucas sort of situation here. Oh, my favorite character in Pride and Prejudice. Exactly. Miss Carrie's slaying the story. Great. I love it. Okay, good. I was going to be like, oh no, what if one of them gets married to freaking, I don't know, either one of them, any of them, but good. Okay. I'm glad that they're just there. So they say they want to reschedule, but Colonel Brandon said he's not sure when he's coming back which is wild. John Middleton says he'll go to London and pick Brandon up if he doesn't come back. And then Mrs. Jennings says, oh, good. When you go, you should also find out what business brought him to London in the first place. And John's like, I don't want to pry. I suppose it is something he is ashamed of. Well, yeah, I mean, he's acting really shady. So like, he's like, I'm not trying to get involved in his business here. Which is fair. And I like John still. um, So I agree with him there. So Brandon leaves, but before he goes, he asks Eleanor if there's any chance of him seeing her or her sisters in town this winter, and she says, probably not, and then he says, quote, then I must bid you farewell for a longer time than I should wish to do. (sighs) To me, that is hot. Specifically saying to do at the end of a sentence, I don't know why, but like, in a British accent. I don't know. I was just listening to this audiobook a few weeks, months ago. Weeks, months. Some amount of time. And the narrator was British. And when he ended in sentences was like, I have not. I was like, that's hot. Then I should wish to do, to do, to do. It was just, it's hot. Anyway, he is saying to Eleanor, and I know that he asks about her sisters too, but he's specifically saying to Eleanor, I'm bidding you farewell for longer than I should wish to do. And it's just, it made me... ah, ah. So anyway, then he just bows to Marianne and leaves without saying anything to her. So good. Well, at this point, we know that Brandon does have some feelings for Marianne. And I love this move because it's just like disaster boy has no concept of how to like say goodbye to his crush. For sure. But let's just for a moment, I put down my phone because let's pick this apart. Boy has a crush on girl, befriends girl's best friend or sister, best friend's sister knows that boy has crush on sister, but still hangs out with him and like comforts him and they grow closer and closer. And then eventually no longer does he have a crush on girl, has a crush on sister instead, and then they fall in love. And I think that this is a plot of a movie that I've seen recently, but it's also the plot of Sudden Sensibility by Jane Austen, in my opinion. So Becca is looking down. (laughs) As soon as he is gone, everyone starts complaining about their day being ruined. And Mrs. Jennings says she is certain this is about Miss Williams. And I first I was like, who is Miss Williams? And then we find out that Miss Williams is his daughter? Record scratch? Record scratch daughter. Because we know that he's been spurned in love somehow, but daughter. Whoops. 
Oopsed. So I was listening to our last episode with my mom and we were talking about him being spurned in love. And she was like, well, what hat? Like, why is he not married? And I was like, oh, uh, I don't know. And she was like, well, did he get someone pregnant? Because he's like 35 and he doesn't have any kind of relationship. And I was like, yeah, he fucking did. Apparently, I guess we'll find out more. But I mean, I, he had to have. Yeah, you didn't think you were going to see the concept of illegitimate child come up in this book, did you? No. So well, first of all, I was wondering, is this an illegitimate child or did the wife mom pass away I had lots of theories going on one illegitimate child two married and divorced three dead widowed you mean (laughs) Colonel Brandon is alive at this point in the books I was thinking of uh three she's dead and then how old is this daughter all questions why is he not hanging out with her is she with her mom so many things don't know anyway daughter on the table all right whoops (laughs) whoops so the party collectively decides that Though, quote, happiness could only be enjoyed at Whitwell, they should try to have fun. So they decide to go on some carriage rides. I love how overly dramatic everyone is being. They're like, we could only be happy if we went to Whitwell, but we might as well ride in our carriage. To be fair, they showed up. They were like, it's like there's a ski trip. Everyone shows up. They brought their skis. They brought their winter gear. They're having like a cup of cocoa before they go only to have it canceled last minute. Sure, I would be upset too. It is a little bit selfish though, because like clearly Brandon's upset and everyone's just like, oh man, the lake. Yeah, I. this is the thing about Brandon is that I feel like he's kind of, gosh, it's kind of like what they said in the last set of chapters, which is that he's the person who people like having around, but no one ever thinks to invite him or something. He's kind of like in like a teen movie all right, have you seen Booksmart? Uh, yes, I love that movie. Me too. And he's kind of like the guy who's played by that really cute one who drives people places. Oh, you're talking about Gigi's friend, Jared? Yeah, yeah, Jared. He has a car and he like just wants everyone to have a good time. And he like drives them to his party because he wants them to come to his party. And then he just like drives them around and I feel like that's more John Middleton than Colonel Brandon. Yeah, I guess you're kind of right because he has the big house with the party and I'm trying to think of a better analogy for who I think Colonel Brandon is. No, I think you're getting to the very important point that people are ungrateful for how awesome Colonel Brandon is. Yes. Thank you. That is fair. So Marion and Willoughby get into the carriage and immediately disappear. And then everyone else has their nice rides in the carriages. And when Marion and Willoughby return, they say they had a good carriage ride that they only didn't see them around because they kept to the roads. But everyone else was on the downs, so they just didn't see each other. But then at dinner, Willoughby sits between Eleanor and Marianne and on Eleanor's other side is Mrs. Jennings. And she leans behind Eleanor and says to Marianne, I know where you and Willoughby went today. And Willoughby is like, yeah, we we were in my carriage. And then she says, yes, Mr. Impudence. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Mrs. Jennings. She says, I know that. I meant where you went in the carriage. She says they went to Allenham Court. And Eleanor thinks this is a lie because... It would be improper of Marianne to go to Allenham Court while Mrs. Smith was there and only with Willoughby. And I guess Mrs. Smith is the mysterious old lady. Yes. Perhaps Willoughby's aunt? Yes. Okay. Marianne tells Eleanor that it is actually true. And she's like, you can't get mad at me because I know that you also really wanted to see the house and you would probably do the same thing. And Eleanor is like, well, it was improper for you to go with Willoughby by yourself. And Marianne says that she has never spent a pleasanter morning in her life. And then Eleanor says, the pleasantness of an employment does not always evince its propriety. Very true, just generally. but Just generally. Also, I think, like, Eleanor is getting at something here. Yes, I had thoughts. I don't know what they were, but I felt it was important to bring it up. I think I was going more for the uh, potential sex joke. <laughs> oh, go for it. Just that the pleasantness of an employment does not always evince its propriety. I mean, yeah. I mean, and they went to Allenham Court by themselves. I mean, yeah. I don't think that's what happened, but... I mean, it's not clear, is it? It's not clear. It's meant to be kind of cloudy, and Marianne is like, she's obviously not embarrassed that she went, but she also, I think she knows that it wasn't the best choice. I think the way she speaks in this moment makes you know that like she got caught up in the moment yeah and she says like she doesn't think she did anything wrong because 
you know, the house will one day be Willoughby's and dot, dot, dot. And then Eleanor's like, you mean the house is one day going to be yours? And even so, it was still wrong. And then Marianne blushes and she's like, she knows that one, Eleanor was right. But two, she's blushing because she's like, yeah, the house will one day be mine. And then she says eventually, yeah, maybe it wasn't proper. But if you could just see the house, I'm telling you. And then she just goes off to describe every room in great detail. Every room. (laughs) Every room. So. That's the end of that chapter, and it brings us to chapter 14, in which Mrs. Jennings simply will not shut up about Colonel Brandon leaving. She mentions that it could be his estate at Delaford, um, which I guess is where he's from, and that his brother left it in bad shape, or like bad shape financially, question mark, brother, question mark, dead brother. I believe so, yes, because Colonel Brandon has inherited a lot of wealth. So Colonel Brandon's rich. Yes. He's rich and she's handsome. He's rich and she's handsome. And his brother is dead. I believe so. Because he's the he's the eldest. And the, the implication here is that his brother had it before him, did a bad job, and now Colonel Brandon's like cleaning up the mess. I wonder how his brother died. Dead brother, sick sister, no parents, this poor man. So she thinks it must be money problems or something with Miss Williams, his daughter, or his sister. But she hopes it will all clear up soon and that he... Here's what she said. Well, I wish him out of all his trouble with all my heart and a good wife into the bargain. Because we know where her brain is always. Oh, yes. Though Eleanor is really interested in the welfare of Colonel Brandon, as it says in the book, she's too busy wondering why Marianne and Willoughby haven't told anyone that they are engaged. So question mark on that. First of all, she's just not listening to anything about Colonel Brandon because she's trying to she's hung up on Marianne and Willoughby engaged. I think that this has been brought up before, but still, I just, I know that they're just speculating, but I'm, they're pretty certain. I get confused because I'm editing previous episodes while I'm reading. So I'm like, did we talk about this? Yeah, we did, right? We have talked about the fact that Marianne and Willoughby are sort of obsessed with each other and everyone can see it. We've also talked about the fact that he took a lock of her hair. Yeah, which is weird. Oh, yeah, super weird. But it also kind of evinces that like. intimate. Yes, and it it evinces that there is a like a lock on this in some way, so to speak. <laughs> a lock on this. That was good. So Eleanor is remembering that and wondering why they haven't told anyone, and feeling probably kind of insulted because she's supposed to be close with her sister. She gets that they can't really be thinking about marriage yet because quote though Willoughby was independent, there was no reason to believe him rich. Now this is something that in the last episode I was like, is Willoughby rich? And we were just we had decided that, yes, he is. But actually, he is very much not because his estate makes 700 a year, but he lives too expensively for that. Like he buys himself nice things and all of this stuff, has too many servants, whatever. And he's constantly complaining of his poverty. Yeah. And I think this is notable. You asked me before if Willoughby was rich and like he's rich in a way that like he's a good match in society. But a lot of it is that he's like living luxury he's a gentleman and he's set to inherit allen and port which is you know a good amount of money murder could be that kind of book i mean it's already darker than you thought it was gonna be yes i've been also like mrs dashwood was staying home sick from this whole outing where is she is she gonna make it like (laughs) this could be dark so willoughby is not as rich as he wishes he was but he could be rich in the future But right now he's like constantly complaining about being poor. And even considering that, Eleanor still doesn't know why they're not saying they're engaged or that they're going to become engaged. And she thinks that this behavior is so weird for both of them that maybe they're actually not engaged. And that's my opinion, is that they're not engaged. They're not telling you they're engaged because they're not. And they have not talked about this. That's my opinion. I guess we'll see. I guess we will. So Willoughby is is very smitten and he's already behaving like he's related to them and he hangs out with them all the time. And one night while he's hanging out with them, he gets very upset that Mrs. Dashwood wants to make changes to the cottage. Those changes that we talked about in like chapter three or something. Mm -hmm. He gets very upset and he begs her not to. And he thinks that the cottage is perfect as it is. And this is where I noticed how similar he and Marianne are in that they are both incredibly overdramatic. Oh, yes. 
Absolutely. And everything that happens is the worst thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Dashwood is like, would it really cause you that much pain if we made changes to the house? And he says, to me, it is faultless. Nay, more, I consider it as the only form of building in which happiness is attainable. And were I rich enough, I would instantly pull comb down and build it up again in the exact plan of this cottage. That's a little bit much. Yeah, he's just very poetic about having grown attached to the space. You know, people like that who are like, oh, man, I I know it's not perfect, but it's my everything. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yes, but not to this degree. But I get it. Like, I get what he's saying. I'm just like, "Eh." is Combe his estate? Yes, that's his estate. Okay, great. After he says that, Eleanor jokes that, yeah, he'd keep the dark stairs and the smoky kitchen. And he's like, yep, definitely would do that. And Eleanor says that even though the stairs at his house are wider and the rooms at his house are better and bigger, he will soon find his house just as faultless as this as soon as he's back there. And he's like, no, no, only Barton Cottage will do. Then he tells them that he used to pass this cottage all the time, wishing people lived there so that he could visit it because he liked it so much. And now Mrs. Dashwood would ruin all the rooms in which they've spent all this time together. And I kind of get that. I mean, he met the love of his life at this cottage, maybe. Yeah. And he like he and Marianne have just been sitting and reciting Shakespeare at each other in a corner at this like parlor. Of course, he wants it to stay exactly the same. Like people get very reminiscent. Uh, not to call out Mike on this podcast again, but when I left my apartment in New York, he got all misty about it. And like when he left his apartment and he he moved into a different apartment in New York, he got all misty about it because he's like, oh, this is where we did this together. This is where we did that again. It's sweet. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Oh, yeah. People in love, man. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's cute. I guess it's cute. It's a lot of drama for like a few renovations. Yeah. The main thing that I think is getting to me about it because I get all the sentiments. I just don't know. We had an entire chapter dedicated to it. But, you know, Jane's going to do what Jane's going to do. Yes, she is. That could be on a t-shirt. <laughs> Jane's going to do what Jane's going to do. Yeah, it's wild because we cover so much ground in the last chapter. And then Jane in this one is just like, yeah, Willoughby's going to monologue about how much he loves Barton Cottage. Yeah, I hope it becomes important. I don't know if it will. But I wonder if they like, ooh, what if there was a fire or something? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah, this one's more dramatic than the last one. So... <laughs> Anything could happen. A wave from the sea just comes up and knocks it down and Willoughby says, how dare you, ocean? <laughs> then Mrs. Dashwood says she she promises she will not. And this makes him very happy that like she won't, you know, renovate. And the next quote from me is very foreshadowy. So I, I've quoted it here. Tell me that not only your house will remain the same, but that I shall ever find you and yours as unchanged as your dwelling, and that you will always consider me with the kindness which has made everything belonging to you so dear to me. Hmm. I wonder if one day he will not be considered dear to them. Then he says he will come back the next day at four o'clock, and that's it. That he'll come the next day at four o'clock. And oh, does he. <laughs> and oh, does he. So much happens. <laughs> I think it's worth saying, listeners, that this book is like, headed to high drama now like we've seen these chapters things are happening the lasagna is fully moldy now yeah look at you look at you things are beginning to grow in the lasagna grow yes they grow so that brings us to chapter 15 Mrs. Dashwood, Eleanor, and Margaret go to see Lady Middleton, but Marianne stays back because she's, quote, busy, which Mrs. Dashwood knows is code for she wants to go hang out with Willoughby, and she thinks that's great. So she's like, yeah, you stay home. This is the next day when he's supposed to be coming at four after they hang out with Lady Middleton. My thought was, isn't that improper? Oh, Um, yeah. Like Mrs. Dashwood? I mean, Mrs. Dashwood is not as careful about making sure her daughters are always being proper, and, you know... Marianne and Willoughby have been doing a lot of kind of improper stuff. They've been hanging out alone a lot. They've also been not at all shy about how obsessed with each other they are. Yeah, like at the parties, you're supposed to dance with more than one partner. Yeah, like look at how like Jane and Bingley acted. And granted, Jane is shy, but like that's like such a proper courtship. And no one questioned that they were courting except Bingley. Yeah, and Jane. But that (laughs) sort of 
like the level of PDA that we've been getting from Marion and Willoughby is not appropriate in this society. It was revered in certain works of literature by this society, but not done in person. Right. And to be fair, it's kind of how it is here. Like we all love stories about people ripping off their clothes and kissing in the rain. But if anybody you knew actually did that, you'd be like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, <gasps> you're so right. Like if if you were just walking down the street and you saw people like doing the notebook, you'd be like, get a room. Imagine you're on the plane and the wedding singer and Adam Sandler stands up and sings. I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm trying to watch a movie. It's like I have another seven hours on this plane and my Benadryl just kicked in to put me to sleep. And you're going to be here singing on your freaking guitar. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. imagine being sung to in person. No, I don't like it. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. The movies are unrealistic. And listeners, romance is alive and well, but maybe just like not as it is in movies. Yeah. Although I did recently watch Serendipity. And what was nice about that movie is that when they finally reunite at the end, it's just the two of them in an empty ice skating rink. Which, like, also wouldn't happen, but... <laughs> yeah, how are they on the ice skating rink? Well, oh, I know how. Because it's actually a roller skating rink, and it's July, or, like, it's the summer, and then it starts snowing, because it's, like, the first day that they met, it was snowing, and anyway, it's a good movie. It's very cute. It has um, John Cusack in it, and what's her name? The British one. Who's Tilda the... Swinton. No. <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> how dare you? Wow, that was a callback. I'll never let you live that down. Back to the drama. Back to the drama. They return from Lady Middleton's house. And when they return, Willoughby's carriage is there as expected. They go inside and find Marianne running out of the parlor, sobbing. She runs upstairs. She doesn't see them. They go into the living room and they find Willoughby also looking equally upset. And they're like, oh my God, is Marianne ill? And he says, no, no. I might be ill as I'm suffering under a very heavy disappointment, being that he has to leave immediately. Now, all right, first of all, what? Well, okay. What he says is that Mrs. Smith, by privilege of her riches, like she's holding her wealth over him, making him leave to do something for her. Something is afoot. First, Sorry, I feel like that needs another sound effect, like a dun-dun-dun, something is afoot. Something is afoot. Like, Brandon leaves in a hurry. And then Willoughby leaves, also in a hurry. And both of them are like, we don't know when we're coming back. Like, that's weird. Homest. 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 So he says that Mrs. Dashwood's like, well, I hope you'll come back soon. And he's like, I only come once a year to visit Mrs. Smith. So I don't know when I'll be back. And she's like, you can come stay here anytime. And he doesn't accept, which is rude. And... Then he leaves and everyone is just shocked that he didn't accept. And here's what I think. I think that he's, I don't like Willoughby. I think he's selfish. He says, I will not torment myself any longer by remaining among friends whose society it is impossible for me to now enjoy. That's a weenie response to this situation. Yes. I don't think it's giving too much away to say that Willoughby is being a dick here. He's being a dick. He's being a weenie. He's being another euphemism for penis. Like He's being a fanny. <laughs> He's being a fanny. Yeah, there's clearly some offstage intricacy that Willoughby is not voicing. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't seem to have voiced to Marianne either at this point. He just says, I have to leave. And then she's like, what? And then he's like, bye. Yeah. And he doesn't specify anything. It's just a very stark contrast to how he's been the entire book so far. Yeah, I... I think it has to be related to what's going on with Colonel Brandon in some way or another. I don't know how, but I think it must. Now he's gone and we have to figure out what happened. So they're talking back and forth, Eleanor and Mrs. Dashwood. They think it doesn't seem likely that they had a fight, but he's acting so weird. Mrs. Dashwood says she's pretty sure she knows what happened. Mrs. Smith can tell that he likes Marianne and wants to stop them from getting engaged because Marianne is below his station or something. And since he's dependent on her for his future wealth, just like Eddie was dependent on his mom and sisters and whatever, he dares not tell her of their engagement because Mrs. Dashwood fully believes that they are engaged and he dares not disobey her orders. So that's why he's leaving. 
she thinks, Eleanor, you may say that this may or may not have happened. And Eleanor is like, yeah, that's exactly what I would say. Like, <laughs> we can't be jumping to conclusions. And then Mrs. Dashwood, I, I wrote down that Mrs. Dashwood's reply to that is what we would call projecting. Because she immediately is like, you would believe Willoughby to be to blame, even though he is just as hurt as Marianne. And she wants to know what Eleanor suspects him of. And Eleanor is like, just something is afoot. Eleanor is a smart lady. And she's like, mm, something just completely 180 here. Something's wrong. Yeah. And she doesn't want to suspect him of anything. She wants to believe the best of him. She just knows that something's off. She doesn't know what it is. She says... It's true about his circumstances and being dependent and all that. And he probably has sufficient reasons for his behavior, but she wonders why he wouldn't tell them what the reasons are. Like, just tell us what's going on. It's like when you walk into a room and everyone's talking about you and then they stop talking when you get in the room. That's what he's doing. Like, what's going on? Mrs. Dashwood basically stops listening to Eleanor after she says there was truth in what she said. She was like, it's true what you say about blah, blah, blah. And Mrs. Dashwood was like, thank goodness, you think I'm right. And that's the end of that for that. Then Eleanor is like, not so fast. It may make sense for him to lie to Mrs. Smith, but why are they both lying to us about their engagement if they really are engaged? And Mrs. Dashwood, I wrote that her response is iconic. She says, Concealing it from us? My dear child, do you accuse Willoughby and Marianne of concealment? This is strange indeed, when your eyes have been reproaching them every day for incautiousness. True. Then Eleanor says that she doesn't need any proof of their affection, but she needs proof of their engagement. So she's saying, I know that they're in love. I just need to know if they're engaged. Mrs. Dashwood is really certain of both. And has put all of her faith in this. She says their actions speak loudly enough. And every day he's asked for Mrs. Dashwood's consent in how he behaves toward her. Yeah, I think this is a pretty testy water to be on for the Dashwoods, just because as a general rule, believe people's words, not their actions necessarily, because we've all been in a situation where the signals have all pointed towards a specific romance between, you know, yourself and another person. And then the other person, you know, for whatever reason, shuts down, shuts off, snipes you, goes all defensive on you, goes, I want this, but I don't want the commitment. Like, there's a lot of different stuff there. And it doesn't mean they're not into you, but it does mean that you should leave. (laughs) Yes, it's kind of like what Wickham did to Georgiana, in a way. I mean... He made her believe with his actions that they were a thing. I mean, this is also the Jane Bennett route because this is also theoretically what Bingley did to Jane. Right, right. From her perspective anyway, he didn't realize he was doing it though. Exactly. But even as happy as we are that Jane and Bingley end up together, that is not because of anything the two of them did. That is because both Lizzie and Darcy were like, hmm, we need to get out of here. We need to stop meddling here. That's why that happened. But when someone up and leaves you high and dry, you should not assume that they're coming back for like as a personal thing. Yes. Yes, I totally agree. And I think that Marianne does not appear to me to think that he's coming back. Mrs. Dashwood is very positive that he wouldn't have left without saying that like, I'll wait for you. Like, we'll be together again. Like, that they have this mutual agreement that they will be married the next time they see each other. But I don't know where she's getting that idea from. To be fair human beings it's hard to trust our instincts on people and everyone believes like everyone feels chemistry like our instincts tell that but then we all question our own instincts because we feel insecure in ourselves and we feel like oh I have to have imagined that because that person doesn't want me and it's those two things that are constantly pushing against each other and you know Mrs. Dashwood's feeling it by proxy through her daughter but It's not crazy for her to think that, seeing how Willoughby and Marianne were. It's just a risky way to think. Yeah, and she it's like she's not paying attention to the state in which they parted ways. Oh, yes. Because they both seemed upset. Eleanor responds that every circumstance except for one is in favor of their engagement. The one being the fact that neither of them have said that they're engaged, which, again, Eleanor, logical, yes. That one circumstance, she says outweighs all the other circumstances, which 
honestly, I'd have to agree with. I mean, sometimes people don't say that they like each other and that's or that they don't want to tell people before they're ready. But like Marianne tells people her feelings. So, yes, agree. Mrs. Dashwood says that she must think that he doesn't love Marianne at all. And Eleanor is like, yes, he does love Marianne. Mrs. Dashwood says, how do you think that he loves her if you think that he could leave without ensuring their future together? And I think that this shows that Mrs. Dashwood really believes the best in people, which is nice for her. Oh, yeah. like that. Eleanor says that she's never considered their marriage as certain. And she thinks that if he writes to her, writes to Marianne, that is, then she will be put at ease. And Mrs. Dashwood is like, you won't believe it until they're at the altar. I wanted to know that Marianne has nothing to offer Willoughby. <gasps> Wait. I, I wanted to bring up the um the economics of dating in Jane Austen. Ram the sound effect. I am so proud of you. Thank you. I thought of it all on my own. Oh my god, it's in the study questions too. I'm really? so proud. Yes. Wow, I thought of that all on my own listeners. Like he's first of all, he's not independently rich. Like he's like we mentioned earlier on in the episode, he's waiting on this inheritance from his aunt who's alive, but he's always complaining that he's poor. And Marianne has literally lost all of her money. They don't have money at all. Yeah. Big pickup there from Miss Molly. I'm learning, y'all. Oh, good catch. Very important. Very notable. (laughs) Wow, I'm so proud of myself. I realized I was like, while I was reading, and again, listeners, it was like 1 a.m. And I was like riveted. And you were like, the economics of dating in Jane Austen. I literally probably went to sleep and then sat upright in the middle of the night and wrote down the economics of dating in Jane Austen. Like, that's probably (laughs) what happened. I was like, wait a minute. How is anybody not noticing this? (laughs) <laughs> Eleanor is. Eleanor is. Eleanor is. That's why she's so like nervous about this whole thing. And she was even nervous about her and Eddie. Yeah. And Eddie is rich. Right. But she was like, I have nothing to offer him. So why would he want to marry me? And like, same to this. Like, why would Willoughby want to marry Marianne? He might love her, but not be able to marry her. And that's what Mrs. Smith is like. You have to go find yourself a rich wife. Who's to say? Who's to say? Whom's, Whom's to say? Whom's to Whoops. Wow, I'm really proud of myself that you just were so happy for me. And- I'm so happy. I'm so happy. So Eleanor talks herself kind of in a circle saying, you know, I do love Willoughby. I think he's great for Marianne. But he's probably behaving this way for good reason. Like you said, mom, and he's probably embarrassed by this whole situation. And that's why he's not saying anything. Mrs. Dashwood then says that Eleanor is coming around now. And besides, like, even though we haven't known him long, everyone else in the area thinks very highly of him. Then she says, had he been independent and in a position to marry right away financially, he probably would have. But for now, since their engagement is, quote, not prosperously begun, secrecy makes the most sense for them. So this is all Mrs. Dashwood saying why she thinks they didn't tell anyone. And it's logical Margaret then enters and interrupts the conversation, and Eleanor has some time to think about it, thinking she hopes it all turns out okay. And then at dinner, Marianne comes down and her eyes are all puffy. She's been crying. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't look at anyone. At one point, her mom touches her hand and she just like bursts into tears and leaves the room. And this just continues all evening because everything reminds her of Willoughby and sends her to tears. And it's really sad. And I've been there, girl. Yes. And that is the end of that chapter. (laughs) Yes. We end on quite an exclamation point and a crying emoji. Crying emoji, exclamation point, exclamation point. Then that little like shiny eyes, pouty face one. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. The one with like the black eyes and little white dots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So that brings us to Becca's study questions. Yay. A lot to cover in this chapter. So I, I tried to focus on the bigger points. First, the great Brandon exit. Theory. I literally don't know. There's so many things that were thrown out at us in that first chapter. He's got a sick sister. He's got a dead brother in an estate that's in bad shape. And he's got a daughter of an unknown age. It could be any of those three things. I think it's probably got to do with the daughter, if I had to guess, because they can't just they can't just throw that out there and then like not have it be about that. So I think something's to do with the daughter and maybe the mother of the daughter. To be honest, in my mind, I had not put together illegitimate daughter 
like I had not put that together until you said the word illegitimate, even though I knew that she was illegitimate because he's not married. And when I talked about it with my mom, she was like, did he get someone knocked up? And I was like, yeah, he did. But I didn't even think about the fact that in that time period, that was simply not done. People had illegitimate children in this time period. People just didn't claim their illegitimate children in this time period. Right. So do you think so? Hmm, I mean, you know, I can't say do you think I, I know what happened Do I think <laughs> do I think that this is an illegitimate daughter that he has a relationship with? Maybe he's got to go see her. Something is going on. Maybe her mother died. He says it's business. He says it's on business. What does he do? He's a colonel. Um, <laughs> It's got to be something with the daughter, though. He's lying about the business. You're literally that meme of Charlie by the wall in the mailroom right now. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I don't know who Charlie is, but I know the meme. Oh, it's from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. He's trying to uncover a great mailroom conspiracy, and he, like, hasn't slept, and he's got, like, a cigarette, and he's like, this is the mailroom plot. And it's become a meme for everyone talking about a conspiracy theory. And sitting sideways and I'm like, maybe it's the mother, maybe it's the sister, maybe it's the daughter. How does the, all these threads connect? I'm, I'm close, I'm close, I'm close. They must all connect because I'm, besides the fact that Jane Austen has named everybody John, I believe that she's a good author and knows what <laughs> she's doing. <laughs> okay, so that's the first question. Second question, uh, let's talk about Marianne's visit to Alanum. We touched on this. Mm-hmm. But what does it mean that she went there just with Willoughby and like while Mrs. Smith was there? Yeah, people don't do that. First of all, let's talk about just with Willoughby. In Pride and Prejudice, all of the courting was done in the presence of the family, essentially. Like someone would call on the whole family to flirt with Jane, for example. Thingley would call on everyone. That's why Darcy was there half the time. Like it's just not done that you like in Bridgerton having been in the garden alone with someone was a terrible thing to have have happen. And that's why Daphne's brother was like, you can't have been in the garden. So like, it's bad that they went alone. Then the fact that Mrs. Smith was there, I feel like you're not supposed to meet someone's mother without your mother meeting their mother. I mean, she says aunt, but like, I feel like when you're young people, your parents are supposed to be involved. And like, you're not supposed to be the first person to meet a suitor's family. There's a lot of magic to the Willoughby and Marianne romance because it doesn't fit into the box of the time period romance. Mm -hmm. I think they both love that about this relationship they have going on, but it is so dangerous for all the reasons we're talking about. Marianne is young and passionate and beautiful. And, you know, Jane Austen's implying something here. And... What she's implying here, we can talk all day about whether or not Jane Austen's implication occurred in the story or didn't occur in the story. The point is we can question it. Are you saying she's implying that something happened at Alanum? I think there's at least enough of an implication there to question what happened. Now, Jane Austen's a pretty proper writer. We know this. Mm -hmm. But we learned in Pride and Prejudice through the Lydia Wickham plotline that, like, she didn't have no knowledge of the way things operated in more seedy corners of society. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very good faith debate to be had about whether what I'm picking up on is something that Jane Austen laid down. But I think the point is, from the lens of someone, I can logically make that inference. And if you can logically make that inference, you've done something wrong in that time period. Yeah. And you want to know what? That makes me so mad at Willoughby. I don't like him. I don't like that. First of all, while Marianne is 17 and she is a woman and we have talked about this and he's 25 and he, well, there's not a huge power dynamic going on there, especially with him not being rich. He knows what he's doing and he can't just whisk her off to his estate, maybe do some stuff, and then leave. Willoughby, wait on the hand stuff. No, but really, you're completely correct that there's there's so much danger to a woman's reputation in that situation that, like, it is reckless for a man to put her in that situation. And as much as there was mutual consent there, like, because I'm sure there was, because Marianne is totally into him, too, and they have a great relationship, but Willoughby, you know, I mean, but you know what? Fuck it. 
Marianne too. She should have known better. They both should have known better. Yes. Now you're sounding like an Eleanor. Yeah. <laughs> Shame on you. The more, okay, the more, so at the beginning of this book, I was like, I'm such a Marianne. And while I still think that that is true, I regret that decision. And I get when Robin was on our show and you asked her which Jane Austen character she was, she went, oh no, I'm a Marianne. And I... <laughs> I get it now. I mean, I think there's a lot of good to be said about how Marianne operates. This is not her most flattering chapters. No, I mean, listen, I'm into the big romantic gestures. I'm into the exciting, like, whatever might happen in Allenham Court while no one's around. Like, I'm into that. I think that it's hot. I think it's romantic. Um, I think that breaking the rules is hot and romantic. However, the Eleanor half of me is like, you should have known better. And I think that's sort of the, <laughs> there's a lot to be said about whether or not Eleanor and Mary Ann are simply just two halves of Jade Austen's brain fighting at all times. Yeah, I could see that. All right, next question. We learn a bit about, well, it's kind of worth talking about this here, but you beat me to the punch. We learn a little bit about Willoughby's financial situation here. What are your thoughts? Yeah, he's not in a position to be marrying someone who has no money. She has nothing to offer him. I'm also, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that he and Eddie are both dependent on other situations. And I mentioned that earlier, but I had never heard the phrase dependent before in Pride and Prejudice. I mean, I've heard the the phrase, obviously. I Well, that's because Bingley and Darcy were both already wealthy. Right. Like they'd gotten their inheritance right they were living it so i think that it's interesting to have these men who don't have control over their fates in that same way right now i mean we know that he's going to get the money eventually another question would be where's willoughby's parents are they dead i mean they're they're not a factor (laughs) they're not a factor so his inheritance is coming from his aunt entirely i mean he's got his estate that he inherited i guess from his parents but like very convenient of jane austen to kill off all of our love interests parents oh i guess eddie's parents are still alive his mom anyway um but anyway yes dependent makes for him not being in a place to be with marianne and that's what mrs dashwood is picking up on i think she's like i think that's also what eleanor is picking up on as well yeah they're picking up on it and for some reason it comforts mrs dashwood because she knows that like that's why he's keeping it a secret mrs dashwood's picking up on oh forbidden love even more in romantic and engaging and love conquers all. How can you look at these two beautiful young people and see anything but love? And Eleanor is picking up on, huh, some real world considerations are really at play here that could get people hurt. Yeah, so there's like multiple aspects of it that are being brought out. All right, next question. We talked a bit about this in the first question, but we learned a bit about Colonel Brandon's family here. We learn about three different members of his family What kind of picture does this paint of Brandon? Okay, we learn about six sister, potentially six sister, that I'm assuming is younger, that he is some sort of caregiver for. We learn about daughter, who he's 35. I'm guessing daughter is like 10. If she's older, that would be even wilder. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So that means that he is the father of a daughter, which means that there is a mother out there somewhere. And then we learned about brother, dead, dead brother, dead brother. And so we already knew about his potential ex-lover. And I'm guessing that is the same (laughs) ex-lover that the daughter came from, unless he was really getting busy. So I'm starting to paint a picture in my mind of what happened there. He was talking about a young person having to grow up really fast and change her opinions of the world. That makes me think that she was really young when she got pregnant. Then the daughter might be older than 10, which is wild. I don't know. It just makes Colonel Brandon seem more of a wild card than I thought. Yeah, he's a wild card. And he's also a caregiver, potentially. And maybe his brother was helping caregive. And like, what happened to his brother? I, I just, there's so much happening. Um, It's a broken family. His, his family has fallen apart a little bit. He's trying to hold it together. He's trying to be the man of the house. I don't know, but it seems like everyone's scattered. They're all over the place. What's he doing at this place when he has a daughter and a sick sister to be taken care of? I just want to know, are there other people in the picture helping to take care of these people? Is the ex-wife girlfriend still in the picture? Many a question. Many a question. Okay, 
The Great Willoughby Exit. Theories. Okay. One, Mrs. Dashwood is correct. And Mrs. Smith doesn't want him to be with Marianne and has sent him away. That's a possibility that I think is a fair possibility. Wildest Dreams. Willoughby is a secret lover of Brandon's sister and she's dying and Brandon called him away to come and say goodbye. I just, the reason I say that is not necessarily because I think it's actually what's going to happen. Although as it came together in my brain, I thought it could be fun. Oh yes. Not to kill the sister, but is that I think that they have to be interconnected somehow. And I don't know how they might be, but I think that it has to be. It has to be. I mean, how else could it be? There's probably a lot of ways it could be connected. Because what does Willoughby do for a living? Does he have a job? He's a gentleman. And being a gentleman is a job. Yeah, we talked about this. Like, employment is looked down upon in society a little bit. Right, 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 right. Okay. (sighs) So he couldn't have been called away on business. I mean, business is running an estate for a lot of these guys. Right. So, but that wouldn't have called him to town. So I want it to be connected to Colonel Brandon's thing because it's too much of a coincidence that they both were called away and had to leave immediately and don't know when they're coming back. Something is afoot. Something is afoot. I really don't have any theories that aren't like wildly far-fetched. So I'm going to go with he's like in lover of the sister in some way or something. Okay. That brings us to the standbys. So funniest quote. So this wasn't a funny section of the book. It was just a high drama section. So I decided to go with Eleanor's quote. I'm afraid that the pleasantness of an employment does not always evince its propriety because that could mean so many things. Eleanor is such a fucking wit. Underrated because she's always seen as sort of practical and all this stuff. But love her little snipes. Yeah. All right. Questions moving forward. I got to say it again. Whomst. Whomst? Whomst? Yeah, but but I have more. I have more. Oh, okay, okay, okay. First of all, what has drawn Brandon away? Second of all, what has drawn Willoughby away? Third of all, did Willoughby and Marianne make any sort of promise to each other or did they break up? Because Marianne's been awfully quiet. Okay. And finally, who wins the chapters? This one's going to go to Eleanor. I was thinking the same thing. She hasn't won an episode yet. And I really think this one, she she definitely comes off best. Yeah, she is the main character of all three chapters. Like, all three chapters are experienced through her eyes, pretty much. Oh, yeah. And I think that, like, we are kind of trying to piece things together along with her. So, yeah, I felt very uh, safe in her hands, these three chapters. So I'm going to give it to her. I love that. <laughs> That warms my heart. Oh, my God. Okay, that concludes this episode of Pod and Prejudice. Molly, how are you feeling? I am so glad that I can finally read the next however many chapters we're reading because, as you said, I was very upset that this was my stopping point. Well, I'm so sorry to disappoint you, but you're only reading two chapters next oh, week. No. We're going to be reading <laughs> chapters 16 and 17. I realized after I gave you these chapters that it was a rather long bit, and I think we'll do better in the next bit, going two by two for a bit. So listeners, if you're following along, read chapters 16 and 17 for our next episode. And until next time, stay proper. And find yourself someone who will give you just a little bit of notice before they disappear to London and say that they're never coming back. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit of notice. We're going for a bare minimum here. Yeah, just a little bit. Far is low. (laughs) Far is really low. Far is low. (laughs) Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.